morning, Central. It is so good to be back. Um, it feels a bit weird. And as Brian said last week, it is strange without having you all here. Um, but there is a lovely familiarity about it. It's a little tiny taste of what normality could look like in the future. And we can't wait to have you all back with us here. Um, however, it's a good reminder that this, the fabric of this building, the bricks and mortar here, that is not church. This is our building, but it's not us. Um, our body of Christ, our church, we are still very much as living and breathing um, as we were five months ago. Um, and so it's wonderful to be able to stand here once again and just remember um, the body of Christ that we are, remember all our different parts. And it has been wonderful over the past few months just to see all of those parts working together. Um, we have chosen our worship this morning um, thinking about our souls and thinking about the refuge for our souls that we find in Jesus Christ. And so all of, all of the, the hymns we've chosen today um, are to do with anchoring your soul um, in our one true hope in Jesus Christ. Hebrews is a book that's all about God's promise and about the certainty of that promise. And in Hebrews 6, verse 19, it says, We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner of, on our behalf. How amazing to think that we don't have any of those constraints of the Old Testament that we can freely enter into a place of worship with God this morning. Um, so we're going to do that and let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this building. Thank you for the symbol that it is for us and the symbol of hope that we will all meet once again together. Um, but we thank you also that no matter being um, separated by distance and across screens, um, that you are just as alive yesterday, today and forevermore. And that we can come together as this family, as this church, as this body of Christ, Lord, to worship at your feet. And so please bless us as we um, continue with our service this morning. Um, and we hope that our worship is pleasing to your ears. Amen.
Well, thanks to uh, Mary and Caelan there uh, for their introduction and for their musical worship there this morning. Thank you very much. Now today we start a new series and the series is based on Romans chapter 8 and Bert will be taking us through that series over the next few Sunday mornings. Now next Sunday um, summer's passed apparently because we now have an evening service on Sunday evening next Sunday and a new series is starting there, uh, Jonah. It's on the book of Jonah, Running from Mercy is the title um, it's been given and we'll have different speakers for that. Um, then we have uh, today we have um, a kids talk um, and I'm talking to the children about clothes. Mm. Then what about photos? <sighs> now we have um, a kids talk this morning. I've got a kids talk for the children um, and I'm talking about clothes. Now let's see about photographs. Well, the Slimming Club started up uh, this week on Thursday evening and here's their social distancing stuff in place in the corridor in number 11. <laughs> um, oh, this is us out in a walk at the Dean Park. Jean sitting in the seat in front of the big um, tree there. And of course ducks doing what ducks do. But um, this next one was is, uh, this duck here, or this geese, so this goose, sorry. Um, it's um, I think it's the male, and I think it's maybe had an altercation with a fox or something because its wing is uh, broken or damaged in some way. It's got feathers sticking out everywhere. And this is one of the the young geese. And that evening it was getting late by the time we were walking back home uh, around the, the Borland Road and it was a lovely sunset and I thought I would take a wee silhouette there. Now, the Hamiltons have got a new pup. He's called Rocco. Now, how cute is that? Those big eyes, mmm. Ah well, too bad about the sleepless nights they're having at the moment, but that's another story, isn't it? And Isabel sent us a picture last week of our great big tall sunflower, and this week she sent me a picture with the butterflies enjoying the nectar, obviously, from um, the sunflower. And then uh, the other day when I was uh, coming from Morrison's, um, it's not often you see a train in the street, is it? But uh, round about what used to be Barclays here, it used to be a fairly common sight, I suppose. So this was two locomotives, um, which I thought was quite interesting. And then down at Prestwick Beach the other night as well. Um, lovely, lovely evening. Now, I've got a wee video that Ewan and Christine sent me. Did you push the button? Because I didn't hear it. Did you push the button? Because I didn't hear it. I could watch that wee caterpillar for ages, but we better get on with the service, I think. Um, now, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that Jean Barclay had been doing a walk 70 miles in seven days, I think it was, she was doing. And uh, I thought, well, I should check and see how she had got on. So here's the web page. Uh, she was hoping to raise £1,500 and she raised £2,795 at the time of uh, this recording. So there we are. Not bad. Well done. Uh, well done to Jean. OK, so now we'll, uh, we'll have the children's talk and then... Pastor Bert will be with us um, and we'll hear what he has to say to us today. Well, good morning, children. Um, Pastor Bert today is going to talk about uh, being in Christ. 
The Apostle Paul talks about that in Romans chapter 8 where he's going to be reading from. But another thing Paul says in Galatians is he talks about being clothed with Christ Jesus. He says when we become Christians it's like we get a new set of clothes. Now we're here in my bedroom today because we're going to be talking about clothes but don't worry you won't be seeing me put my pants on or anything like that. I'm going to be using hats today. Well, I've got a t-shirt here as well that I want to show you. Because this t-shirt, for example, says Grand Canyon. Now, I actually bought this at the Grand Canyon. But, of course, you could go down the street in Kilmarnock and get a t-shirt that says Grand Canyon, I would imagine, and wear it. But there's a difference, isn't there? I've been to Grand Canyon and this t-shirt actually was bought at Grand Canyon and so what we wear can say things about us but sometimes it doesn't tell the truth it doesn't tell us the whole story if you like because I could also have bought this t-shirt down the street somewhere maybe not this exact one but one that says Grand Canyon on it I would imagine now, when it comes to hats, well, I like hats, and generally speaking, this is my hat. This is what I would wear down the street if it was a cold day particularly. In the winter time, I've always got this hat on, or another one like it. I like bonnets, and a lot of men in Scotland, and some women indeed as well, wear bonnets. But then, of course, you've got hats like this. And I quite often, especially from the holiday, I'm wearing a hat like this, a baseball cap, they call them, don't they? And this one, again, I bought it when I was on holiday. It says Lanzarote on it, and that's where I was when I bought it. So that one says Lanzarote. But then, sometimes what we wear can tell us something about what we're doing. And if I was to put this on, I'm sure you would all say, Oh, Alec must be going out on his bike. Or he's just come back for being on his bike. Or if you saw me driving down the road in my car with it on, you'd be saying, He's a bit daft, isn't he? That's for wearing when you're on your bike. So certain pieces of clothes say something quite specific about us um, when we're wearing them, doesn't it? Another hat I've got is this one, and this is the hat of the MG Owners Club, and it says MG on it. Now this hat tells you the fact that I'm in the MG Owners Club, and of course, as most of you probably know, I have an old MG. It's a 40, what, 7 years old um, my MG. So that tells people I'm interested in old MGs, doesn't it? Now, I have another piece of headgear here. Now, this piece of headgear, in fact, I'll just get up and go back a bit and show you the size this is. This is really big, isn't it? <laughs> this is called a kafia. And I got this in Jordan. And men in Jordan often wear things like this. You think, well, how do they wear that? That looks more like something a woman would put on. Well, I'm going to show you how they wear this. And at the very least, when you see me putting this on, you'll get a laugh if nothing else. Okay, you Put it into a triangle first of all, and then it goes over like, like this. And now I'm looking like an old granny from a hundred years ago or so. And then you give it a twist like so, and then you take this bit round about here like so, and then you tuck it back in here. Okay, so far so good. And then you take this bit at this side, and you give it a twist in the way like so 
and then you take it round the back and then over the top and then you tuck that bit in here like so and there you have it you have the whole headdress now if I get down here you can see me like this and then I'll turn round about you can see what it's like at the back now men in Jordan wear this particular type of headdress with this particular type of pattern and colours and sometimes a green colour as well and they wear that regularly and that's how they go about and so this people in the Middle East if they saw me wearing this would make an assumption probably that well maybe he comes from Jordan and then of course other people in the Middle East other countries have a similar type of head dress that they wear and it, it's got different patterns or no pattern at all on it of course so that's a Jordanian kafia. so what is Paul talking about when he says we have to put on Christ Jesus well you see what we do says a lot about us if we say we're a Christian and then we go about telling lies or we're very rude or we steal then people look at us and think that's what a Christian's about and of course it's not what a Christian's about but if we do what Paul says and we put on Christ Jesus well that's like living like Jesus would want us to live indeed living like Jesus lived when he was here on earth kind to everybody trying to do good trying to make sure that we don't sin that we don't do things that are wrong but rather living like Christ Jesus would want us to live that's what putting on Christ Jesus is all about good morning everyone it's lovely to um, to be back with you and uh, lovely to, to gather around together as, as a church family uh, online uh, we're going to start a new series this morning we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 8 we'll be doing that over the next six weeks uh, under the title life in the spirit as I was praying about it I was praying and thinking about what we should do next as a church what teaching uh, we should be looking through and uh, the life in the spirit or the Holy Spirit was something that was on my heart and as I was reading through in the Bible, trying to uh, think and pray through where exactly we should be looking, I was drawn to Romans uh, chapter 8, uh, which talks all about that, talks all about life in the Spirit. And it's a really, really powerful chapter uh, to look through. Um, at this time, more than, more than ever, I suppose, uh, living with the coronavirus, living under lockdown, all this uncertainty, um, there's one thing that we can be sure of, and that is, uh, that is God, that is the Holy Spirit. Um, in, in our lives, working in us, working through us. And uh, so it's really important for us to grasp what it means uh, to continue to live in the Spirit. And uh, Paul uh, does an amazing job of, of teaching that for us in Romans chapter 8. So I pray that you'll be encouraged by this over the next few weeks and, uh, and challenged as well because uh, God's Word is also very, very challenging um, for us. So um, let's read it just now together uh, and then I'll pray before we go into it. This is Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 1 to 4. It says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit heavenly father we thank you for your word again lord we thank you for the challenge thank you for the encouragement lord we thank you for the teaching of your word and father i thank you that um, we can we can look to the to the spirit um, we can look to you for hope and we can look to you for a, a, a sure and certain future um, Lord we, we we just thank you for um, life in the spirit and father there is um, 
there's nowhere better to be as Christians than to, to, to be in your will, to be submitting to you, to be yielding to you. We're not called in this life um, to, to go it on our own. We're not called in this life to, to be all we can be. We're called to submit to you. We're called to follow you. We're called to trust in you. And help us to do that, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Martin Lloyd-Jones uh, wrote a, a, an enormous commentary, 14 volumes, uh, on the book of Romans. Two of those volumes cover Romans chapter 8. Uh, and he said that not only is this the, the most important chapter in Romans, it could possibly be the most, in chap the, the most important chapter in all of Scripture. And that comes from what we read in the first verse, and, and, I, and I will come back to that. We're going to cover that in, in, in a lot of detail. But he also talks about how context is key. Context, understanding the context of what you're reading is really, really important. By that, I mean understanding what's gone before um, and what's come after and what's round about the passage that you're looking at. If you don't consider the context, you can pretty much take any verse and make it mean what you want. And that is part of the, the problem that, the, that Christianity has today, is that people, are take, people take verses, they take random verses from the Old Testament, from various parts of the New Testament, and they, they don't consider the context, you know, why it was written, who it was written to, what, what was going on at the time, none of these things. And they can pretty much make it say what they want it to say. Uh, and that's a huge problem. So for Martin Lloyd-Jones, he was talking about the importance of context. And we find that here because that first word, therefore, is a connecting word, which means that something has gone on before. It's really important for us to understand. Something significant has gone on. And in chapter 7 of Romans, Paul shows us that Christians still wrestle with indwelling sin. He says in, in chapter 7, verse 15, But what I hate... I, I do. Let me, read, let me read it to you in full. I do not understand what I do. He's referencing his own sin here. And he says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. I was reading a story. There have there been... There have been some great stories coming out of, of lockdown. There's some inspirational things happening and you read about them in the news. But there are also some heartbreaking stories. People who have lost loved ones, people whose businesses have collapsed and all sorts of things in between. And one story that caught my eye was a man who, um, before lockdown, was very successful. He, he worked in, in the city and he, and he was a businessman. Um, and he would go out after work, as a lot of people do in the cities, and he would enjoy a drink with his, his colleagues. He would have a drink at the weekend. But he was very successful in, in his life, you know, a lot of money, house, etc. And what he was, his story was that he had become dependent on alcohol during lockdown. Um, and it was, it was really a sad story uh, reading it. But this is the way he described it was this, and it, and it relates to what Paul's talking about here. He said this, every time I finished the last drop of bottle, the last drop in the bottle, I'd say this, no more. That's it. No more tomorrow. Yet at roughly the same time the next night, he would find himself draining the last drop of the bottle. He was a man who knew what he wanted to do, yet he was powerless to do it. And Paul is saying the same thing here in, in relation to his sin. I, I, I know what I want to do. By that he means, we can assume, follow God, live a, a holy life. But, but, but what he hates, he does, referencing his sin. He's come to hate what he does. And Christians, as, as part of our salvation, uh, our minds are, are uh, transformed. A revolution goes on in our minds. And, and it means that we have a, a disgust for sin. It means that we have an inability to find any lasting pleasure in it. We may have a, a, a fleeting feeling of pleasure at the beginning, but any lasting pleasure is gone. All we're left with is guilt and shame. When you become a Christian, the Spirit of God comes in and it, transfor it transforms you so that you want God, so that you want holiness, so that you want righteousness, so that these are the things that you desire after. But your flesh, your sinful nature is still powerful enough to keep you from doing what your new desires want. Your, your flesh is, is at war. Chapter 7 doesn't give us the whole picture. Um, that's why context is, is, is crucial. 
Because in chapter 8, Paul gives us directions on, on this life in the Spirit. He gives us instructions how we do that, how we do, how we live this life in the Spirit. And unless we live by that, we're always going to find ourselves continually doing what we hate to do. We're always going to find ourselves in a position where we say after we've sinned, after we've done something, that that persistent sin, whatever it is you're struggling with, you say, right, that's it. No more. Tomorrow, that's it. This is the last time I'm going to do that. But you'll find yourself doing it again unless you're able to learn to live your life in the Spirit. In the Spirit. Before Paul gives us these directions, before Paul teaches this, he gives us one of the greatest statements of Scripture. And that's why Martin Lloyd-Jones recognised this as possibly the greatest chapter in Scripture. One of the greatest statements in Scripture, verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Just let that sink in. If you're a Christian, there is now no condemnation from God, from our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, yeah, other people will condemn you. Other people will condemn you. But there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. No condemnation. Now, as I said in verse 1, this word therefore, it means there's a connection to something that's come before. And if you look for a minute, if you were to flip back to Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, this is what Paul says. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight. In God's sight. By the works of the law. Rather through the law we become conscious of our sin. And that is condemnation. We become conscious of our sin. And that's, that's what happens when you become a Christian. The Holy Spirit convicts you and you become conscious of your sin. And you're condemned. You feel condemned. And however, far, far part, however far back Paul is looking in his teaching. The great truth of this first verse if you're a Christian, should knock you for sex. No condemnation. That is the position of Christians today. No condemnation. There are now no conditions for us to meet. And the basis for this, the foundation for it, is in verse 1. That we are in Christ Jesus. To be not condemned, which is, which is a legal term, to be not condemned means that we're free of any debt, we're free of any penalty. But you may think, well, you know, I'm, I'm basically a good person, you know, basically a good person. But what Genesis 3 reminds us of, and that Paul cements in Romans 3, is that no one is good. Not one is good. So to find yourself in a position where there's no charge against you, you have to be a person who is in Christ Jesus. To come under this, no condemnation. You have to be in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus, then these two words, no condemnation in verse 1, are the best words that you're going to hear all day. They're the best words you're going to hear all week, all month, all year. No condemnation. Now the verse doesn't say, therefore there, is, there are now no mistakes, or no failure, or no sins, because Christians fail, because Christians make mistakes, because Christians sin. The greats of the Bible, Moses, David, Abraham, Noah, they did all of these things. They made mistakes, they failed, they sinned. And you can suffer from the consequences of your sin in this life. Absolutely. You can suffer from the consequences of your sin as a Christian. But you are not condemned. You are not condemned. The law of, of double jeopardy, Actually, maybe I should have consulted Campbell on this. I'm not sure if this exists in the UK, but I think in America the law of double jeopardy exists. Maybe I'm just taking it from an old Tommy Lee Jones film. But uh, in theory, anyway, the law of double jeopardy means that you cannot be tried twice for the same crime. You cannot be tried twice for the same crime. So since Jesus paid the penalty for your sin, Jesus paid the penalty for my sin, and we are now in Christ... God will never condemn you because of that, because of that idea of double jeopardy, that somebody's already paid the price. So you don't have to. So you never will have to. And that means that God has got nothing against us. He finds no fault. He's got nothing to punish us for. Because he's, because he's punished Christ in our place. 
but it goes further. Because we're not just not condemned in the, the here and now. For Christians, Paul says that there is there's no longer any condemnation ever. Ever. It's not just removed for a little while and then you feel good about yourself and then you have a catastrophic failure and you're, you're then under condemnation again. It's important to take this on board because so many Christians think like that and live their lives like that under this cloud of condemnation. They think it's only temporary, temporarily removed. That it's lurking in the dark. As soon as you make a mistake, as soon as you sin, as soon as you do something against God, there you are, you're condemned again. Tim Keller is, is, is fantastic with this. Um, and he says this, many believe that Christians who confess sin and then live a good life and are forgiven and are at that moment not condemned. But they believe that if they should sin, then they're back under condemnation until they confess and repent again. So if a person died before they were able to confess, they would be under God's condemnation. But Paul is saying, if you're a Christian, then you're never under God's condemnation. It's been dealt, it's all been dealt with, all your sin, once and for all time. You're not under condemnation anymore. If that was true, if, if what Keller was, was illustrating there was true, then Christians would be people who are, who are, who are always move, moving back and forward, in and out of condemnation. I feel great, I feel terrible, I feel great, I feel terrible. And this, this view doesn't match up with the intensity of Paul's statement here and, and how Paul uh, writes the book of Romans, nor, nor what Paul writes in the previous seven chapters. It doesn't match up. This, this life of, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm forgiven and, and, then I, and then I'll sin and then I feel condemned again. And he says that condemnation literally does not exist anymore. If that's you, if you're a person who, who does go back and forward, back and forward, under condemnation, feeling guilty, feel, then look at verse 1 again. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The moment we come into a relationship with Christ, condemnation is gone forever. There's nothing but acceptance and welcome from God. Martin, eh, Martin Lloyd-Jones again says this, most of our troubles are due to our failure to realise the truth of this verse. Verse 1, most of our troubles are due to our failure to realise the truth of this verse, that we're no longer on, under condemnation. So how does all of this work? Well, verse 2 explains that. Um, verse 2, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The Holy Spirit brings us freedom. Um, in your old life, before you become a Christian, you're under the, you're under the law of, of, of sin and death, but now you're under the Spirit. And so you're free because the Spirit brings freedom. The Holy Spirit brings freedom. Paul gives the Spirit, he talks about the Holy Spirit here, but he calls it um, the Spirit of life. It reminds us and that the first mention of the Spirit in the Bible is in Genesis, um, chapter 1, when the Spirit brings life. You know, the Holy Spirit um, was there in Genesis, chapter 1. The Holy Spirit um, didn't just arrive at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was there. In Genesis, chapter 1, verse 2, the Holy Spirit brought life. The Holy Spirit administers the work of God the Father. The Holy Spirit secures our freedom. And this work is described in, in verses 3 and 4. Let me, let me read it. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, according to the spirit. The law held up its perfect standard. The law being the, the, the first five books of the, of the Bible, 
you know, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. That's where the law is contained. You know, over 600 different laws that the, the, the Jewish people had to live by. And the law was perfect because God created it. But it was unable to empower people to live up to God's standards. It was unable to do that because of the weakness, not of God, because not of the weakness of God's law or something that God had done, but because of the weakness of human flesh. There was nothing wrong with God's law. The problem was, verse 3, the beginning of verse 3, what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. And since our flesh is inadequate, God had to send someone else. God had to do something. And he sent Christ. He sent him, verse, the second part of verse 3. So verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. What did God do? God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Now Paul didn't say Christ came in sinful flesh because that would imply that sin was in him. And he didn't say that he came uh, in the likeness of flesh because that would imply that Christ only seemed only seemed to be in the flesh. He says the likeness of sinful flesh because Christ took on our flesh without becoming a sinner. And the reason that he was able to condemn sin and the reason that we're able to live with no condemnation was because of our fallen human nature never entirely overtook Christ's life. It never entirely overtook him. And what all of this means for us is given in verse 4. Let me read it again. In order that the righteous requirement of the law, which had to be met, the righteous requirement of the law had to be met, but it couldn't be met in us because of our flesh. The righteous requirement of the law might fully be met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we couldn't do anything about it, but Christ came and he could. The Holy Spirit creates a new humanity in us. And that humanity is characterised by people who walk according to the Spirit. And that's what we're meant to do as Christians. And now this new humanity, through our union with Christ, is, is filled with the power um, to live in a way that is, is pleasing to God. Um, not pleasing to other people, but pleasing to God. Everything the law required is now realising the lives of those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit. Everything the law required is all realised in the lives of you and I because we're controlled by the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit, um, through Christ, has now set us free from, from sin, from death. So when we yield to the Spirit, we're free. We no longer have to sin. Sin doesn't have a hold on us anymore. And through the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the perfect life of Christ is communicated to us. Now, this is just as great a miracle as when the Spirit was hovering over the waters at the beginning of creation um, and, and, and creating the world from nothing. It's just as big a miracle that we are made righteous through Christ. And God, God looks at us and he, and he sees the righteousness of Christ. You, you look at your, 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 your fellow brother and sister in Christ and you probably see some flaws and some faults and some things that you maybe want to say to them about. But God looks at us and he sees us as Christ, as Christ's righteousness. And that's miraculous. And that's true, that's the truth though. And that's incredible. But why did he do this? Why did God send Christ to bear our condemnation, to bear all of these sins? Why was it broken? For what purpose? Well, verse 4 tells us that everything Christ did for us, his incarnation, which, which means that he became human, he became flesh, his death, his resurrection, all of it, what was it all to do with? It was all so that we might be able to live a holy life. So that we could live a life of 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 holiness. Now that's amazing. Um, the thing that Jesus lives for, the purpose of his entire life, is to make us holy. Fulfilling the righteous requirement of the law that we be holy. It's the greatest possible 
motivation for living a holy life. To think that that's what Christ was doing, making us holy. What a motivation for us to live a holy life. Whenever we sin, we frustrate the purposes of God in our lives. We frustrate the ministry of Jesus in our life. And if that doesn't work as an incentive for holy living, then nothing will. This is powerful stuff. And I cannot end without going back to, to verse 3. Because this verse int introduces us to the theme of the gospel of salvation and redemption. Let me just read it quickly. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. That's our salvation complete there in the second part of that, that verse. He sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. God has done something for us that neither we nor the law could ever do for us. And this is the heart of the gospel. And this is what makes Paul rejoice. In chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Verse 3 tells us that that, that this is God's salvation. What the law was powerless to do, which is to save us, God did. Sending his own son. That was his plan. Because man was helpless. Man was powerless. Man's condition was sin and, and shame and failure. And then God sends his son. And the Bible makes it absolutely crystal clear that this was not an afterthought. That it was planned before the foundation of the world. God wasn't taken by surprise when, when man sinned. He didn't sit and say, oh, I can't believe Adam and Eve have just sinned. Our salvation was planned before man. Our salvation, yours and mine, was planned before Adam and Eve were created. Before the world was ever brought into being, our salvation was planned. Do we not worship an almighty, awesome God? You are not condemned. There are so many things that might be happening to you right now um, amidst COVID-19. You might be struggling with your health. You might be struggling with your finances. You might be struggling when you think about the future, your family, all of these things. But know this, Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, and that should cause us to rejoice and that should motivate us to live a holy life before a holy God let's just pray Our Heavenly Father we thank you for the words of Paul again um, Lord help us to rejoice help us to rejoice in the fact that there is no longer any condemnation over us you hold nothing against us. No punishment. Nothing. All of it poured out on Christ. To spare us going through that. So that we could live by the Spirit. So that we could have a relationship with you. So that we could yield to you. So that our life didn't have to be back and forward under sin. Being under condemnation. Trying our best, making it about us and what we can do. You made it possible for it to be about you. And we thank you for that. And Lord, I pray for our church. I pray for Central. I pray for the many people who, who may be looking on from other parts of the country or the world or whatever. That they will know this, in this moment. That there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And Lord, may we go from here into the afternoon and just enjoy that and rest in the reality of that over our lives. That there may be a million things going on, that there may be so many pressing issues, things that are demanding our attention, people that are demanding our attention. 
but we can go and we can know for sure, for absolutely certain, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Okay, thanks for being with us again today. Thanks to everyone who's been involved in the in the, the service today, uh, to Bert and to Marion Keelan. Um, and remember, uh, tomorrow at ten thirty, um, Bell Adams will be on the summer devotions. This will be the last of the summer devotions. Another sign that summer's ending. <laughs> and remember, join us next Sunday. Thanks for being with us. Bye. Would you like prayer or pastoral care of some kind or practical help or just someone to talk to? Then contact us at cccomarnock at gmail.com. Now, if you're a female and would prefer to talk to a female, then just mention that when you contact us and we'll arrange that for you. cccomarnock at gmail.com.